So this first video is going to be about what an implicature actually is. We're going to learn something about how to identify them. And we're going to work mostly through thinking about particular examples. So let's start by thinking about two examples. One example is, imagine somebody said to you something like this. They said, well, the professor is doing well this semester. He hasn't started breakdancing in class yet. So let's just say he hasn't started breakdancing in class yet. Now, if we think about a sentence like that and a, an imaginary situation in which it might have been uttered, we would tend to conclude that the speaker meant to say more than just he hasn't started breakdancing yet. We would take them to be communicating more than just that, or we would infer more from what they've told us than just that. We would tend to infer something like, well, the professor usually or sometimes breakdances in class. Maybe we also infer that they're trying to stop breakdancing in class or something like that. But we tend to infer more from this sentence ju than just what it literally says. We tend to infer this further information. The professor sometimes has been known to break down the class, and maybe, maybe more than once. That's one example. And in this example, this extra information is what we're going to call an implicature. This, an utterance of this sentence tends to implicate the further information that the professor sometimes or usually breakdances in class. So this is one example of an implicature. We have a, a sentence saying more than it literally means when used in particular contexts. Let's think about one more example sort of on a similar line. So imagine you overhear somebody talking about this class and one person asks, oh, so what are, what are Professor Boylan's lectures like? Or, They ask this question, and you hear the response, he is great, he has lovely handwriting. Okay, so not even a true response, but let's imagine it is. Let's think about what this answer says. So what they've literally said is they made a comment about my handwriting. But is that all that they've communicated by answering the question in this way? It seems like the answer is pretty clearly not. What they're trying to do, although indirectly, is say that my lectures are not very good. Maybe that BB is a bad lecturer, or not a good lecturer. Again, this is an example of an implicature. It's something that's communicated by the sentence that goes beyond its literal meaning. He is lovely handwriting doesn't literally mean David Boylan is not a good lecturer, but it does in this context, in the context of this being the question people are discussing, it does tend to communicate this further information. So that's why this is an implicature. So in general, the way we can understand an implicature, we'll dig more into it in, in, in videos to come, but the way we can understand an implicature is it's information that tends to be communicated by a sentence over and above what that sentence literally means. So in this example, the handwriting example, being a bad lecturer is not part of the meaning of this sentence. In the previous example about the breakdancing, the implicature that the, the professor sometimes breakdance, that's again not part of the literal meaning of what, what was said. So this extra communicated information in these cases, that's what we're going to call implicatures. And the way we can think about implicature is sorted through a simple formula probably over simple, but it's good enough for us today. We can think about the, whole, the sum total of what is communicated. That is, all of the information that people tend to draw from your utterance, all of the, everything that they're able to infer from what you said. And we can sort of break it into two parts. One part is just the literal content. That is, the information literally conveyed by your words. But what we've seen is that there's 
the, in these implicatures, they tend to give information that goes beyond the literal content. So what's communicated contains this extra part, oftentimes, which is what's, in, what's implicated. So you can think of the sum total of what's communicated by an utterance as the literal content of what's said, plus any implicatures that, might be, that, the, that the sentence might have in that particular context of utterance. So that's what an implicature is. The idea is that it's a kind of information that's attached to sentences that is not part of the literal meaning, but does tend to be communicated whenever the sentence is used. I want to now start thinking about, well, how do we know whether something is an implicature or not? So we know in this, according to this formula, you know, there's all of this stuff that gets communicated by particular utterances. But how do we figure out which stuff goes in the literal content, and how do we figure out what's an implicature? And this is what we're going to focus on, the question, how do we know what, what, what is implicated rather than literally said? And we're going to talk about some tests for implicature that Grice gives. Now, Grice is pretty clear about this, that he doesn't think these tests are 100% reliable. They're in, very, in some cases, the tests either can't be applied or they give the wrong answer, but they're pretty good for the most part. One really important kind of test is what we call cancelability. So one way you can figure out that something is really an implicature rather than part of the literal content that's what's said is if normally you could basically deny that you mean to implicate the thing. So let's take a simple example. Take a sentence like, I tried to stop him. Now usually this has the implication that you failed. Because if I say I tried to stop him and I don't say anything else, usually you'll conclude that I was not successful. That's just what we'd normally conclude. So it seems like in a case like this, this is an implicature of what I've said. But how do we know it's an implicature? Well, how do we know that the information that we failed is not part of the, of the literal content of what's said? Well, one way can, we could see it is that you could use the sentence in such a way that makes clear you don't mean to communicate that. And you could do that by just denying the implicature. So you could say, I tried to stop him, and boy did I succeed. So let's think about this case. So it's slightly different. So I said the sentence initially, I tried to stop him, and then I add, and boy did I succeed. In this case, is it still communicated? That, the, that it ended in failure, just like in the original case. In the original case, we had this implicature, or what we were calling an implicature, that the, the attempt was not successful. Do we get the same thing here? It looks like obviously not, because the second part of what I'm saying is just denying the implicature. So here we don't get the implicature that the attempt ended in failure. So this is one way to see why this content, the content that we failed, is not part of the literal contents of, of the sentence. It's, it's something that's merely implicated. It's something that goes beyond the literal content. Because we could just literally deny that that's what we're saying, and the implicature would go away. We would obviously no longer be communicating that we failed if we, if we denied that. And notice, if, it, if so imagine it, it was literally part of the content that whenever you tried to stop somebody, that part of what that means is, is that you failed. Well, if saying I tried to stop him, if part of the meaning of that was that you failed, well then this sentence here would just be incoherent. Because the first part would entail that you failed, and the second part would entail that you didn't fail. So if, the, if what we're calling the implicature in the original case was really part of the meaning, then it would make no sense to deny it. You wouldn't be able to deny it. You would just be contradicting yourself. You're clearly not contradicting yourself, though, and so that's good reason to think that this content is not part of the literal content, really it's an implicature. So that's how the cancelability test works. One way we can see that something is an implicature rather than part of the literal content is just by seeing, well, can you just coherently deny that that's what you're saying? When you, when you say you tried to stop him, can you coherently deny the supposed implicature? If you can, that looks like a good reason to think it's an implicature, because 
if it was part of the literal content, it would be it would be incoherent. If you can't, then that's evidence against it being an impligature. So that's our first test. I'm just going to say something about why this isn't a perfect test. So this test, like the other one we're going to talk about, there are some cases where it doesn't work so so smoothly. The reason why it's not it's not a, a totally reliable test is that sometimes implicatures are a little difficult to cancel. So go back to the kind of question and answer example we talked about a moment ago, where somebody asks, how are the lectures? And you reply, oh, the lecturer has nice handwriting. Now you could in that situation go on to say, oh, and I don't mean by, by that that he's a bad lecturer. You could, the entire speech could be, he has very nice handwriting, but I don't mean to say that he's a bad lecturer. That sort of works, but it, it actually still sounds a little bit strange. It doesn't sound quite as natural as the denial of the implicature sounds here. Like here, it sounds perfectly fine to say something which contradicts what you would otherwise implicate. In the handwriting case, it's a little bit weird because basically this question arises of like, well, if you're not trying to implicate that the professor is bad or a bad lecturer, then why were you talking about his handwriting? It's sort of difficult to make sense of the utterance in the first place. So sometimes implicatures are a bit difficult to cancel because without the implicature, the utterance doesn't really make sense in the first place, or it's kind of irrelevant, or it's sort of weird in context. So that's one place where the cancelability sometimes falls down. It's not a total failure in that case, because if we think about the kind of weirdness involved in denying the implicature in the handwriting case, where you say something like, oh, he has lovely handwriting, and I don't mean to say he's a bad lecturer, it doesn't sound like you're literally contradicting yourself, which you would be if it was part of the content. But it's just not perfect because the test would be better if, it, if the sentence was clearly okay, and it's, it's not clearly okay in that situation. So that's a limitation of cancelability. The second test we'll talk about is what's called non-detachability. And the idea here is that when something is an implicature, then any other sentence with the same literal content will tend to have the same implicature. So you can figure out if something is not an implicature, by finding other sentences which, which say the same thing and seeing whether they also communicate the same kind of information. So let me give you an example. So let's go back to the, the trying example. So we said, I tried to stop him. That tends to communicate that you failed, I failed. The non-detachability test says, well, if this is truly an implicature, rather than part of the literal content of what I said, then any other way of expressing the same literal content, any other sentence which has the same literal meaning as that original sentence, will tend to have the same implicature. So how would we go about thinking about non-detachability? Well, the word try and the word attempt they seem to mean basically the same thing. There's no literal difference between saying somebody tried to do something and saying they attempted to do something. So according to the non-detachability test, if the information that I failed is an implicature of the sentence rather than part of its literal content, then, then expressing the same sentence using the word attempt should have the same implicature. So let's write it down and see what happens. So I attempted to stop him. So what we've got to ask ourselves is, if somebody says that sentence out of the blue and they don't say anything more, what would you naturally conclude? Would you naturally conclude that they succeeded or failed or would you not know which? And the observation seems to be that if somebody just says, I attempted to stop him and doesn't say, they don't say anything more, then usually you're going to conclude that they failed. So according to the non-detachability test, the information that I failed really is genuinely an implicature of this sentence. Why is that? Well, we found a different sentence with exactly the same literal content. What the sentence I tried to stop him says, says exactly the same thing. That it has the same literal content as the sentence I attempted to stop him. And what we see is in either case, we get the same extra information. We get the extra information that I failed when you put it this way and when I put it this way. So according to the non-detachability test, this is an implicature because implicatures, what they depend on is the literal content and it's not the particular phrasing. 
in general. Whenever you say, whenever you say literally the same thing with a different form of words, you should get the same implicature if the context, if there's no di other differences in the context. Again, this is not a totally perfect test. One reason is that there are some implicatures that this just doesn't work for because they actually do depend on the exact phrasing. These are called manner implicatures and we're going to talk about them in the next video. But the other limitation of this test, of the non-detachability test, is, well, whether we're able to apply it depends on being able to find a perfect synonym in the first place. So we got lucky here because there is just another word in English for tried, which is attempted. But if we're using a word that has no other synonyms, then we just won't be able to apply the non-detachability test in the first place. So this is a different kind of limitation. It's not that the test gives you the wrong verdict. It's just that sometimes it's not clear whether you'll be able to apply it, because being able to apply it requires there being a synonym in the first place. Okay, so in this video we introduce the idea of an implicature. The idea of an implicature is that when you, you implicate something by saying a sentence, when you tend to convey some extra information beyond just what the sentence literally says. So that for now, that's our rough and ready definition. We'll add more and we'll make it more precise when we see Grice's definition. But for now, that's the basic idea. That's the basic feeling you should get when you hear a sentence of the particular implicature. We then talked about some tests. How do you figure out whether something is an implicature or not? Because we know that what's communicated, it's factored into two parts. It's got the literal content and then it's the implicature. So when something is communicated to you using a particular sentence, how do you know which is which? How do you know whether it's literal content or whether it's part of what's implicated? And we saw two tests. One was the cancelability test. Can you deny the implicature without contradicting yourself? We saw in the attempted case and the trying case, while you would usually communicate the information that you failed if all you said was that you tried, you can just get rid of that implication by just denying it. You can say, I tried and I did succeed. That's perfectly coherent. And that illustrates that the information in that example is an implicature. We also saw the non-detachability test. The non-detachability test says, well, all implicatures, they dip, all they depend on is the literal content. In general, they, own, they don't depend on the particular way in which you said the thing. So if you want to know whether something is an implicature, one way you can do it is, well, try and find words with the same literal meaning and see, do they, do they seem to have the same implicature? That's what we did in the trying and attempting case. We saw that the word try seems to mean the same thing as attempted. And when we look case, looked at the example, we saw that they, they tend to have the same, same sorts of implicature. 